Today is September 18th, 2008, and I am privileged to be here with Harriet Berg, interviewing her for an oral history project, and my name is Sharon Alterman. Harriet, do we have your permission to use the contents of this interview for the historic record? I would be honored. Oh, thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, let's start at the very beginning and talk about your roots. Um, you have had such a long history of involvement in this community, and I know that we should go back and talk about your family and how they got here and, and their because values. I think uh, there's no doubt about it that my home influenced my love of the arts and politics, that I always felt that these two things were very much a part of life. It wasn't something separate. And my mother uh, was from Dolina in Austria, and the Jews of Dolina, which was 60 miles from Vienna, were known for being very cultural and very involved. I don't know, my mother never spoke to me about that, but that was the reputation they had, that they were very interested in culture. And my mother came to this country when she was 16, and met my father in New York, and she always had an interesting story about that because she had two older sisters. And the rules were, you didn't get married until your older sisters did. <laughs> I have a feeling my mother loved <laughs> She didn't want to wait to follow the rules. <laughs> but she and my father came uh, to Detroit in 1918, and uh, they had four daughters. And my older sister was, of course, somebody that I looked up to, my two older sisters. And my um, older sister was very involved in ballet. Mm -hmm. She studied at the Bonstell Playhouse. I don't know if people realize that it was a very famous school of acting and a very important civic theater in Detroit. And there was a member of the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo who taught there and a young woman from Canada whose name was Olga Fricker. And my sister was 16, she was dancing in toe shoes, and my father even made a small studio for her in, uh, in the basement of our flat, a building that he owned on Calvert, in the heart of the Jewish community near Dexter. And uh, I loved to watch my sister practice and I would go down there and practice with her and she was she I think she was really seriously considering a career Olga Fricker was her absolute uh, goddess she was a very beautiful dancer a younger woman who assisted Madame Kazan from Ballet Russe and then one day all the lessons stopped and I never found out about it until much later but Apparently she had gone in for a checkup and she had a heart murmur mm -hmm. and the doctor said, no more dancing. So my father said, nobody in our family is going to study dancing anymore. It gives you heart murmurs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and of course we know now that you can dance with a heart murmur and that dancing does not give you heart murmurs. But so be it, I never had a chance to study. Uh, I would go with her to the studio and envy her classes, but I never had a chance to study myself. Then very luckily, all four of my, all three of my sisters and myself attended Roosevelt, Durfee, mm -hmm. and Central, those wonderful training schools, those where we got this uh, really, what now you get in a private school education. We had music, we had auditorium. I will never forget my auditorium teacher in uh, elementary school, who was a wonderful teacher who introduced us to drama, and I think I played the role uh, of, the, of the rabbit in Alice in Wonderland, my first initiation. And we learned how to sing um, the Marseillaise. We did uh, the Three Bears in French, and this was in elementary school. And then, of course, Roosevelt, Durfee High School, and in high school, I was introduced to modern dance by Jane Mayer. Now, uh, she had a sister who was also uh, a gym teacher. I don't know what exactly what the situation was, but many young women, young, many uh, Jewish young women, who went into education, went into physical education, 
and uh, maybe they wanted to be in sports and at those days you couldn't be. And in physical education, word dance was a part of that program because of a woman by the name of Delia Hussey and because of Ruth Murray who trained physical education teachers at Wayne and all of them had to study modern dance and all of them had to teach creative dance. So we had a very unusual system. Another thing I found out later, we were the only school system in the country where a child would have dance from elementary school through high school. Mm -hmm. So in our elementary school, we learned folk dances, and then in junior high, we learned ballroom dances, like you have to go now to Joe Cornell mm -hmm. for. And then in high school, we were introduced to modern dance because of this wonderful training system uh, that Ruth Murray introduced. So I remember I had uh, a cotton leotard, which was de rigueur in modern dance. You didn't wear tights, you didn't wear ballet slippers, and you did not use French terms. <laughs> and all of the dance terms were in English. Surprise, surprise, you know, that they could be translated into English. That jeté was a leap, that pas, you know, bourrées were runs, and uh, it was a wonderful way to be introduced to dance, and I loved it. I just had the wonderful time. Jane Mayer was a student of uh, another famous teacher in Detroit by the name of Tosha Munstock. And I believe she was married to um, Martin, who worked in the uh, union. And <clears throat> actually, when I graduated from Wayne, uh, May Ruther in invited me to teach modern dance classes for union children. Uh, because she also was a student of Tosha Munstock's, mm -hmm. and my mother met her in Tosha Munstock's classes. My mother took these classes just for exercise and recreation, a lot of her friends. And so it was very natural for me to be a part of modern dance. I was introduced at a very young age. Uh, Tosha Munstock was a student of Heine Holm, who was a student of Mary Widmann, who was one of the founders of German Expressionist modern dance. So that was uh, my introduction to the world of dance. Through another path, not through a, you know, the corner ballet jazz tap studio. It was uh, another route to dance. And I always loved it, but my father didn't think I should study. So I had to wait on high school from high school. And when I went to Wayne State University, I fell in with a group of physical education teachers who loved to dance. And they were uh, juniors and seniors, and later they graduated and they had jobs in the public schools, and they loved to travel, and they, they invited me along. So we would go to New York to the Michael Herman folk dance classes, which were fabulous folk dance classes that met practically every night or you went to the Y uh, for uh, Israeli dance, or you <coughs> went to Berea, Kentucky to learn mm -hmm. American folk dance, and uh, they uh, let me in on their experience. And then they said, well, a lot of the majors, physical education majors, and the people that are in the Wayne University Dance Workshop have signed up for the Army. We're already into the 40s. And we and Miss Murray wants to do a big dance about this is the army, Mrs. Jones. Mm -hmm. She's doing an adaptation. Why didn't you come down for the audition? And they just took anybody who came because they were losing their members to the wax mm -hmm. and the waves and the Air Force. Uh, this was what was going on. And that's how I really started serious study of dance at Wayne State University. Uh, with Julia Sanford and Ruth Murray, who was at that time nationally, internationally known for her work in children's dance education. And uh, she was also not only the head of physical education, the head of the dance at Wayne, which was a part of physical education, but she was also president of the Miles Poetry Club. So that immediately caught my attention because she said we could dance to poetry. Mm -hmm. And I was an English major. 
when I first went to Wayne, and uh, that definitely caught my attention. And she did encourage my work in dance and poetry, which was kind of a new thing. Martha Graham <coughs> was doing dances to Emily Dickinson's poetry, and uh, Miss Murray, who had studied with Martha Graham at Bennington, encouraged us to do dances to poetry. So it, it was seemed a very logical step. And although I didn't have the technique that a person of my age who loved dance should have had at that point, mm -hmm. because I didn't study until I went to college, uh, my creative work and my ability to choreograph was what caught her attention. And she encouraged me and supported my work. And uh, I became her assistant and then director of the Wayne State University Dance Group Workshop uh, after I graduated from the university. And she encouraged me to teach children. And they needed a creative dance teacher. The dance alumni at that time sponsored uh, children's creative dance classes. And she said, Harriet, I think you could do this. And I took her course, <laughs> and I found out, you know, how to plan a lesson, all those good things. And then, of course, by then, I was married, and my husband said, you can do this, you can do it, even though I would have diarrhea every <laughs> Saturday morning. <laughs> I suppose you have to go through that phase. And so uh, those were my first creative dance classes that I taught at the university under her supervision. And I feel I, I really worked with the best, and she steered me in the right direction, helped me with music and lesson plans, and of course her book, Dance in Elementary Education, is like an encyclopedia of dance uh, education, projects for every age, music, poetry, stories, you know, you could open any page and say, this is the class I'm going to teach today. And I think we're going to take a moment to pause I'd like to uh, in the 40s and 50s. I'd just like to go back to one thing. I know we started talking about your family, and I know that you have such a rich Jewish heritage. Would you talk a little bit about that, and how uh, the, those influences upon you yes. as a young person? Uh, uh, for some reason, I was the only one of my four sisters that attended Sunday school. Uh, my mother, I think my mother and father, were very disappointed not to have a boy. My mother came from a very religious background. Her family, uh, her father had been a Hasidic rabbi in Europe who had a court. And mm -hmm. what my grandmother did was cook for the court. And he, can, you know, and he, people would come to him all the time for advice and stay for dinner. Or at the holidays, he'd have a big holiday dinner so that people who had problems they wanted to solve. Uh, and I imagine there was singing and dancing. but. When my grandfather came to America with his 11 children, mm -hmm. uh, he was not in that same position. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, no one ever told us the story, and he just was a poor tailor. Mm -hmm. And I am so sorry that I never knew that story. Mm -hmm. Now, my grandmother was a very unusual woman in the sense that she was very tall for a Jewish woman <laughs> in that period. She was, uh, you know, maybe five foot eleven, and she would come to our house from New York every day for the Pesach, and we had to take out all these dishes and wash the dishes and have the whole, the whole mindset. And uh, she, uh, so my mother had a very strong feeling for religion. My father was totally the opposite. They loved each other. They were a wonderful couple but they had totally opposite views of life. So I was very lucky <laughs> that I got these two different points of view because he was, uh, uh, he was a socialist and he believed in social action and he kept up on all the latest news and we were supporters of Norman Thomas mm -hmm. who ran five times for president and whose platform actually, I mean maybe we shouldn't tell people, but Franklin Delano Roosevelt used his program practically for the sure. New Deal, and it was, you know, it saved our country's economy at that time. So my father was very politically oriented, and uh, he talked about it at the table all the time. 
and I think at one point he did run for some office in the city government, and uh, he was involved with uh, Twin Pines Cooperative, which had a, a farm mm -hmm. uh, where you could go for R&R. &R. And Walter Ruther was a member of this organization that they belonged to, and I remember this story that my mother introduced May Wolf to Walter Ruther and they peeled potatoes for her. <laughs> for a, this is not a very glamorous story, but it is true that they met each other peeling potatoes for a Norman Thomas dinner, which my mother was in charge of. So that was my introduction to politics, yeah. And we knew Walter Ruther and of course then he was a supporter of ADL, Americans for Democratic, ADA action and uh, we were involved in the union movement which was very strong and very important in those days. My father was a union organizer and had his head bashed in a couple of times and, uh, and my mother insisted that I go to Sunday school. Somehow at that point in her life I know she observed the holidays, she lit candles on Friday night, but none of us had a Jewish education. And I attended really what was an excellent, to, to me was excellent education in Jewish history. I don't know, nobody remembers the Cass sisters, two very tall women who taught at that Sunday school. Philip uh, Rosenthal was the, the uh, principal and some of my, well I think Philip Rosenthal was a department head in the Detroit Public Schools. And some of my teachers at uh, Central taught in the high school, at the uh, Sunday school. So that was not learning Hebrew or learning to read from the Torah. For girls at that time, you had a, let's see, what was it called? The confirmation at 60 mm -hmm. at Sharzedek. And I was one of the first confirmation classes, I think 1941 or 42. And Rabbi Hirschman was the rabbi at Charitzedek. He was a brilliant scholar and a very well-known rabbi, and he gave sermons on the holidays oh. <laughs> with the finger <laughs> he taught you. But Rabbi Adler came to Charitzedek at that time, and he was our teacher in our confirmation class. And he was such a wonderful teacher, a wonderful man. And I, I remember him as a very, it was a very wonderful experience. He made things very meaningful for us. And you had to write a story, or you had to do research on a famous figure in uh, Jewish history. And I don't know why, I guess because I liked Isidora Duncan as well as my Jewish history. <laughs> I chose Alexander the Great and his uh, entrance into Jerusalem and the fact that he said that the Jews could practice their religion, even though he, you know, uh, erected Greek statues, but he, he said that they could practice their own religion as well. So that, well, that was the, the figure in history that I wrote about, and I was, I always considered myself very blessed that I had that very solid foundation in Jewish history and knew where we came from, you know, and it introduced me to the ancient history right up to the modern history of Israel. And of course, by the time uh, Israel was founded, I had been married a year, and our son was born four years later on Israel's Independence Day, mm -hmm. <laughs> May 14th, 1951. Tell me about how you, uh, your meeting with Irv. Uh, meeting your with Irv. That also was Beshert, I'm sure. <laughs> but I uh, was taking a class in Shakespeare uh, from, oh, here was the story. I was working at Arthur Murray's, and we, you know, teaching dance at Arthur Murray's. They needed teachers during the war uh, because a lot of GIs or a lot of, sar you know, some captains would come in with their men and they, you know, teach these guys how to dance because they look terrible at the USO. Or <laughs> I want them to know what, so I was teaching these classes at Arthur Murray's and of course teaching till 12 o'clock at night. 
you weren't supposed to go out with your students, but we would meet them at La Conga, which was, you know, now there's dozens of salsa places. That was the only place where you could do the rumba and the salsa, you know, and we'd go there to see the real thing, not Arthur Murray's interpretation, but the real thing. And all these bands would come from Havana. Oh, it was great. So, wouldn't you know my Shakespeare class was nine o'clock in the morning? And uh, I would go there and sit in the back row. <laughs> <laughs> Tired. <laughs> and fall asleep, <laughs> except that the teacher, I don't think I had Hilbery. Irv had Hilbery, Miss Clarence Hilbery himself for, for Shakespeare. And I uh, remember his voice booming out <laughs> because he was waking up all these <laughs> students that were sleeping at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, but so I would be studying, I try to catch up on my studying. I was sitting in one of the study halls at Wayne, and along comes this junior or senior. He asked me very casually, I think we had met through Ruth's, you know, what was I doing? He said, oh, let me help you with that. I studied this with Clarence Hilberry. Let me help you with that. I can, inter I can help you understand this, because I was like, my head was really. So that was really my first meeting with him. And then uh, during the war, I remember he was in the hospital. He had been seriously wounded, and he was sent to a hospital in Tennessee. And uh, I would get a call. Somebody would stick their head into my studio at Arthur Murray's and say, Miss um, Warrock, you have a call from Captain Berg in Tennessee, he wants to reserve a class for his men, and you know, a call from a captain in the army in those days. They even interrupted classes. <laughs> <laughs> so I would go, yes, Captain Berg. I wasn't sure who is this Captain Berg. And they'd start many long years ago, a fellow named Robin Hood. And he and his buddies would sing the song, and I would, or you know. Pardon me, boy, is that the Chattanooga choo-choo? <laughs> I'd have to keep this very serious. Thing. Yes, Captain Berg, I will happy to arrange. <laughs> so uh, I, I saw right away he had a great sense of humor. How can you resist that? And he just was so much fun. He could make fun out of anything. And he still does. And he um, then he saw me riding a bike. And he told his brother, boy. I'd like to marry that girl. <laughs> he knew. Right away. Uh, you know, it took me 20 years to know. But <laughs> Wait, you did and you we marry? went, uh, we had, uh, we too eloped, uh -huh. and uh, we went to Rabbi Adler and asked us, asked him if he would marry us, and he did. We went to, you know, we, I think we went downtown. We went to Canada and had a wonderful dinner in uh, Windsor, and then we went to Rabbi Adler and said we wanted a Jewish wedding. So he married us in his office. It was great. He was very understanding. And uh, then my girlfriend Ruthie Kotler of the Dexter Davison Kotlers married Ozzie Goodman, and they were having their reception that night, and we went and announced that we were married, and we stole their thunder. Oh, their stole husband the never forgave me. <laughs> Not a nice thing to do. So, yeah, and another thing about Irv was, even though he was in a full-body cast, uh, because his leg uh, had been, you know, part of it had been blown away by a German anti-tank shell, he had his leg in a cast. His we would go to Eastwood Gardens, and his buddies would walk him out to the center of the floor with his crutch. Then they'd take his crutch away, and I would come out. And we would jitterbug, and he was the best leader. He would just be standing there and lead me in all these jitter. Fortunately, jitterbug was that kind of a dance. And I don't know that we even talked that much during our first three or four dates. We just danced. We, we literally went dancing. There were a lot of places to dance in those days. I don't know if we went to the Greystone, but Eastwood Gardens, and uh, you know, if, if you went out to a nightclub, uh, you know, with a group, just for any kind of a celebration, people danced. <clears throat> there was always a dance floor there, and there was always live music. 
It wasn't, it was a, not necessarily a big band, but I remember we saw all the big bands came to Detroit. You know, Glenn Miller, no, I think he had already, uh, he had already died, but certainly the Glenn Miller band, Count Basie, and then um, Duke Ellington, you name them, they all came to Detroit. If you didn't see them there, you saw them at the Paradise Theater, uh, which is now Orchestra Hall. Paradise Theater had every big name, Lionel Hampton, Cab Calloway. We saw all of these shows, at, and we visited a lot of black and tans, you know, where there was music and dancing. So the love of music and dance really brought us together and cemented our relationship. Then we found out about each other. <laughs> and there's such a rich <laughs> cultural life here, too, that you're right. describing. It was yes, the Detroit. Arts was, and yeah. Music and dance and, uh, had, you know, for entertainment that you were, that you went to went dancing. There was a dance hall in every neighborhood in Detroit. Uh, Greystone Ballroom was downtown. The Vanity was over there near uh, Gross Point, and uh, a, a Detroit architect, as a matter of fact, built that. Charles Agri, I think, and the Grandy Ballroom. I think that was his too. Uh, so that there were, that's what you did. You went out dancing in a big ballroom with a big band playing the music. And you got a drink for a quarter, and it was great. <laughs> so you were a great ballroom dancer, obviously, yeah. if you taught at Arthur yes, Murray. Murray's right. And, I but it. now let's go back to your days of Wayne, because you spoke about Ruth Murray right. and, and, and your take. opportunities. The, a the pause world. that refreshes at right. this point, okay? Right. Oh, sure. Let me get you some. Uh, wait, what was I going to do with Wayne? Oh, yeah, the teaching. Harriet, let's talk about more about your days at Wayne. Mm -hmm. You, you Very mentioned important Ruth Murray and, and, and your activities with children, but I know that you've had a long run yes. there. Yes, so. uh, that was uh, a very unusual education, I think. Ruth Murray, um, I later did research on her background. And she went to Columbia for her master's. She was a doctor, so she had probably had her PhD too, and was a student of John Dewey, mm -hmm. who had a profound effect on uh, education. And she believed in what was called at that time the workshop way of learning. In other words, the teacher was a mentor or a guide or somebody who facilitated, but that the students were very involved in their education, that you didn't sit at a lecture, but you participated, which now, of course, everybody's very familiar with, but this was on a very profound level. And we, um, she didn't, although she and Delia Hussey choreographed major pieces for our concerts, we gave at least two concerts a year, and then we traveled with the Poetry Club, or uh, we did lecture demonstrations about modern dance in the high schools. We toured uh, spreading the word. Now, Ruth Murray, had, as I said, had studied at Bennington College with the greats of modern dance. And I, again, I was very lucky to have been born into this, or to come into this circle when what I would call the golden years of American modern dance, which had a profound influence on ballet, uh, now has transformed ballet, but modern dance itself is not so well known. But in those days, everybody read John Martin. He was published in our local papers or read the Christian Science Monitor uh, for uh, Margaret Floyd, who was another very important critic. And everybody knew about contemporary dance, and it was very prestigious to be a part of that. We had no big modern dance school in Detroit, so I had to go to New York if I wanted to study. And fortunately, I had this wonderful husband who was a sculptor and an artist, and he understood what it was all about, that you needed to have background, you needed training, you had to be associated with artists to be inspired. And so he would take care of our kids at uh, the Christmas holidays or the spring holidays, and I would go to New York to study with 
Jose Limon, Martha Graham, Merce Cunningham. Mm -hmm. I just was very, very lucky to have that. And I had a girlfriend who lived in New York, had an apartment, and she welcomed me to stay with her. In those days, you could just, you could afford it. Now, young people can't afford it. It's such a different world. But you could go to New York on a low fare. I won't even tell you what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and I could stay with my friend and uh, study with these masters of modern dance. And that was tremendously inspiring. And so uh, when I was a member of the dance workshop, as well as director, I had to choreograph. And that's when I got my first taste at it. So as music students, you study Beethoven and Mozart and Bach, and you play the music of the greats, and that's wonderful. But uh, in dance workshop background, I, we didn't just study about this in dance history. We had an opportunity to do it ourselves because they, they believe that everybody is creative, everybody has that spark. And unlike George Balanchine, who said choreography, you have to be born knowing how to choreograph. It's a craft. It's a craft like any other art, mm -hmm. just as there are systems and methods of composing music or doing a painting composition. There are ways, there are rules of choreography. And, uh, and I studied with Doris Humphrey, who, was, who wrote the leading book on choreography, and with Louis Horst, who had been Martha Graham's teacher and her accompanist. Mm -hmm. And uh, he taught a very interesting course, which now is discredited. But at the time, it was one way of approaching composition. And it was called pre-classic dance forms. And he would take the dances of the period and the music of the period before ballet, say, a gig of the 17th century. And we analyzed the qualities of a jig, and then we made a modern interpretation mm -hmm. of it. So it was a very interesting approach, and <clears throat> uh, he taught many people composition that way. He taught Martha Graham composition that way. In other words, you took this old-time music, dance music, like a minuet or a jig or a passepied, and you interpreted it in your own way in a contemporary theme. And um, once Merce Cunningham came to Detroit, and I was interviewing him about his approaches to composition, I said, didn't you ever do pre-classic dance forms? He says, I am not the least bit interested in pre-classic dance forms. And I was shocked, you know, <laughs> what? Louis Horst didn't get you and tell you you had an over. So, of course, the, we were introduced to all these new ideas at the dance workshop, and Merce Cunningham had entirely different approach to composition. Yes, everybody can compose, but that's not the way to do it. And uh, he, of course, influenced the whole generation of dancers. And it was a very interesting experience because I was there at the height of the popularity and of the uh, great works of Graham uh, that she did based on Greek legends, based on American themes, Appalachian Spring, that piece by Erin Copeland was of course done for a dance, for her dance. And um, then uh, I was there for the change. And then I studied with Merce Cunningham and I studied with Louis Falco, who was a, a disciple of Jose Limon's and uh, of Lucas Hoving. And not only that, I wanted these people to come to Detroit, and I wanted to create a dance community here in Detroit. I wanted to have people I could talk to about modern dance. I wanted to have uh, pe my students see these, these wonderful dancers who were, uh, were so uh, inspired and inspiring. And so I think the Jewish Community Center gave me the chance to do that. Now, I had a role model in the fact that Ruth Murray, Fanny Aronson, Tosha Munstock, all these wonderful ladies, Anne Zeronik, who later taught at Anne Golden, taught at Mumford and at Wayne, uh, had an, a, a, um, a council called the New Dance Council. 
and they brought people into the Detroit Institute of Arts. There was not a film series. That mm -hmm. theater was used for dance and music. And then there was Edith Freeman, who, had the, who was the head of the music committee at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And she was called the Sal Yurok of Detroit because she brought in all these famous musicians and dancers and events to the DIA. And I was on her committee. Mm -hmm. And she was a very important woman in my life, very important woman. She was very cultured, and she loved music and dance, and she'd take a chance. That's where I first saw Jose Limon on the stage. <clears throat> and, and so we had this committee that these women were very involved in, that they did the whole thing, you know, they booked the hall, and they, uh, uh, promoted it, did the promotion, sold the tickets. They were a wonderful group of people to be inspired by. And then uh, what happened was that the United States government was sending all these famous dancers, Alvin Ailey at that time, Jose, Martha, Lewis, all these modern dance companies were being sent to South America and to Europe to on goodwill tours for the United States. This was after the war, and we wanted to show people that not only were we a mighty military power, but we, were, we had culture. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't always easy, because some people in Congress did not approve of Martha Graham going out in her uh, <laughs> uh, form-fitting dress, you know. And uh, there were all other questionable practices <laughs> that they didn't believe in. But somehow, it was pushed through. There was a very strong National Endowment for the Arts. And they sat down and said, you know, all these people have been to Europe, to South America, to China, the Far and Near East, very important uh, concerts that influenced the dance of, of those countries. But you know, they haven't toured in the United States. And they can't afford to. The people in the United States don't even, haven't seen their work. And the National Endowment for an Art, for the Arts did a dance touring residency program. And the Jewish Center was part of a consortium of every major cultural institution in this city. And I remember my, my immediate boss, my bosses are very important, I remember all of them at the Jewish Center, <laughs> but it was Chuck Wolf. And all of a sudden, he was volunteering to go to the airport to pick up Jose Limon mm -hmm because he was coming to Detroit and somebody had to go and pick him up, you know, and bring him uh, to the center because he was going to do a lecture demonstration at the center. So what this was about, Arthur Mitchell was also a part of that, Don Redlich, uh, Meredith Monk, all of these people were brought to the city, not just to perform, but to do lectures in which people could ask them questions and meet them and uh, to do classes, that was the other important. Paul Taylor, I remember, he taught a class at the JCC, and afterwards he said, these are the worst dancers I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm never going to teach her. <laughs> but he had very high standards, and he didn't like to teach beginners, and unfortunately <laughs> there was a mixture. We should have known better. <laughs> yeah, Paul Taylor, so he'd send his uh, students. But these people came to the center Arthur Mitchell, I remember, his beautiful dancers, young people in high school, the first time we saw blacks performing ballet. And it was a wonderful experience. And to meet Arthur Mitchell and to see his dedication, he had, he could have had a fabulous career for many, many more years. But when Martin Luther King was assassinated, he, he, he went to George Balanchine and he said, I've got to do something for my people. I can't just have my own career here. And George helped him found the Dance Theater of Harlem. Mm. And they, <clears throat> we brought them here. The Detroit Metropolitan Dance Project is what it was called. And I was on that committee. And I'll never forget, Arthur Mitchell came on February 14th uh, in the early 70s. And that day, it snowed, the biggest snow we had had oh, yes, all winter, I remember that one. February 14th. Yeah. And we all were, in the afternoon, had a meeting. 
said, we we're going to lose our shirts on this because we had booked uh, Symphony Hall downtown, the Ford Symphony Hall. How are we ever going to no. go? <laughs> Every seat was filled. No. People <laughs> came out. The black community supported this. And uh, here was ballet being performed. He had a profound influence on Detroit, as did Alvin Ailey, of course. And I couldn't, can't believe I looked back. I had a class with Alvin. Only four people showed up. And we danced with Alvin Ailey, and he taught us part of uh, uh, his famous dance, you know, and uh, this was at the JCC at Revelations, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. and uh, and that was the beginning of a friendship with with uh, Alvin Ailey that I met later on. Ruth Murray, I was attending uh, also Connecticut College for Women at this time, which had the which is in New London, Connecticut. After the war or during the war, people felt they couldn't travel up to Vermont because of the gas situation, of course, from New York. And so they moved the American Dance Festival where all the modern dancers came together at one time. It took place in the summer. They moved it from Bennington to New London. And of course, Ruth encouraged us to study. And that summer, Leslie, our daughter was about a year old. She had just started walking. And three of us decided we're going to go. We were all married. And all the husbands babysat <laughs> Leslie during the day and had a wonderful time going around to zoos and, <laughs> and picnics. And their wives attended classes at the American Dance Festival. And that year, Sophie Maslow was there doing um, The People Yes, which was a poem by Carl Sandburg. And Woody Guthrie did the music. He played live music. And he had his son, Arlo, there. And Arlo and Leslie played together, <laughs> you know, while rehearsal was going on. So that was, uh, this is what developed as a pattern that through my interest in dance, through my love of dance, through my husband's support of it, we met some wonderful people. Yeah. We, had, we, we were just able to meet them and know them personally. And it made a great difference in our lives and in our children's lives. I'll never forget one Thanksgiving. Jose was in Detroit, and after the show, we went back. And he said, Harriet, tell me a restaurant where I can take my company. I said, oh, you're not going to go to a restaurant for Thanksgiving. He said, well, I have to feed them dinner. I said, oh, no, they're coming to my house. Mm -hmm. Irving's standing behind me. He said, are you crazy? <laughs> How many people did you have? 25 <laughs> people to dinner. <laughs> and so I called all my friends, and they all made dishes. Oh, and what a wonderful we had a dinner with remembrance. <laughs> yeah. And my kids will never forget that big silver bush pulling up in front oh. of our house. <laughs> and out comes all these dancers. Yeah. And so that was fun. And then, uh, of course, through the center, um, uh, we, after we taught at Starlight, Pennsylvania, we were there for 13 years. I remember Irving had a bar mitzvah party. That was and a B'nai 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 camp? B'nai camp mm -hmm. in Starlight, Pennsylvania. And that was a wonderful experience. And again, it enhanced our Jewishness because they had lectures and uh, had very good lectures about all aspects of Judaism and a very strong Israeli dance program and I'll tell you this that on Friday night everybody in the camp dressed in whites after dinner came out and danced mm. on the basketball court oh, how beautiful. and they turned on all the lights you know like they would for a big game and we had a grand march it was the staff and the administration and all of the children of all ages and uh, that was one of my most successful Israeli dance programs. I had a, an excellent staff, my daughter Leslie, and a young woman from Germany who had been my student at Wayne, and she had been very well trained in Germany with German modern dancers. And she uh, was a gymnast, really, and a dancer. 
and but she loved Israeli dance and she was an excellent teacher and we had this huge program and it was just the most amazing experience and these kids knew a repertory everybody you know would know a half a dozen dances that everybody had been taught so they could all come together and dance together and uh, Israeli dance was very big in Detroit I mean, there were about six or eight groups, Habonim, Hashomer, the youth uh, group from the synagogues. And uh, this just, uh, then uh, Hannah Stiebel, who was a sculptress when she came to Detroit, she was a physical education teacher. Mm -hmm. And she taught me some of my first dances. Jerry Katz, who attended Habonim camp, and later became an assistant to Fred Burke, who was the father of Israeli dance in America. Jerry Katz, an endless supply of dances in his head, and he taught me a lot of dance. So I was able to keep up on the old, on the classical modern dances in that period and use them in young dancer skills. Uh, because as soon as possible at the center, I was teaching children's classes and adult classes but I felt a performing group was very important. That's what dance is all about. It is exercise, it is recreation, it is all those things, but mainly it is the performance, it is an art. And I wanted to share that. And so we formed Young Dancers Guild uh, at the JCC not long after I started there, which was in 1959. Is it going to be 50, 50 years, years next yes. year? Makes my hair stand <laughs> 50 years. And so uh, there were all these invitations, you know, when there was an Israeli event and they wanted somebody to dance. So the kids started off in the company doing Israeli dance and then expanded into a group very much like the Wayne dance group. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was my prototype. And that they did their own choreography and we did big shows for Hanukkah and for Purim. Uh, and uh, it was uh, really the only place in the city where young people could come and do modern dance. Were so they I had Jewish? A, uh, no. So that we, we attracted a lot of people, uh, a certain amount of kids, mm -hmm. who love modern dance, wanted to have a chance to do it, went to the concerts. You know, we used to, when there was a concert, we'd sell 20, 40 tickets. They'd give us tell you how much the tickets cost. <laughs> <laughs> it was very easy to sell them. And we'd go, you know, and everybody wanted to go and see Merce Cunningham. Yeah. Yeah. And to be able to see yeah. these companies that they read about. So we had a Young Dancers Guild. <clears throat> I think I kept that up for uh, until 1989. Then my husband said, this is it, no more teaching seven days a week. So Sunday was when Young Dancers Guild met. That was it. And then, of course, Festival Dancers grew out of my advanced modern dance class uh, at the center. And I was commissioned to do a piece um, for the Music Study Club of Detroit. It was for a holiday. They wanted something that was included, was ecumenical. Okay, so I chose Leonard Bernstein's Ch Chester Psalms. And that was a piece for about nine women. And that was in our repertory for, for about five years because we toured to a lot of churches and synagogues in the beginning, but that was the piece that started us. And then uh, <clears throat> Sophie Maslow came to town, as I said, doing The Village. I knew, a lot of people don't realize, that that was the inspiration for Fiddler on the Roof. And she did this dance, The Village I Knew, using Detroit dancers. That's where I first met her when she came to it. And the people in that group wanted to go on dancing, and then a lot of them were in my classes at the JCC. So that was the beginning. And Fanny had had a group, too. So there was a tradition for an adult performing group. Fanny had a group much earlier at yes, the Yes, much earlier, yeah. yeah. And uh, then uh, Reba Usher was in that, and I think Sylvia Dzukin of that generation. And so we started, the festival dancers started, and then Charles Weidman came. I brought Charles Weidman, I thought, I, I, I just loved his work. 
and his sense of humor. I wanted something that had humor. And he did a dance it's called Mostly About Women, which was about women in the, <clears throat> in the you know, uh, when they first got the boat, when they first learned how to drive. <laughs> and I think there was a scene of a woman performing the first operation. He was great comic movement. And uh, Charles Wyman come in and he said, well, what do you, he says, I want to teach you another dance by Doris Humphrey. He says, brought me all the way here. One dance isn't enough. I said, Charles, we don't have any more time. He said, well, what do you do at one o'clock in the morning? <laughs> he was ready to have rehearsals at one. But he insisted on teaching this beautiful suite of Franz waltzes, which he dedicated to Doris Humphrey and using themes from her dances because she had, he, they were both pioneers of modern dance. It's a wonderful piece. We were exhausted <laughs> with that. But we had that in our repertory. So we had built up a repertory of dances. And that was the beginning of Festival Dancers, which is still amazing. Yeah. And we, we had us, uh, we brought back Sophie Maslow to do a wonderful piece on the Holocaust. She, she was a genius. I told her this story of my husband's mother and sister. Uh, one stayed in Europe, the other came to America with her family. And of course, the European family was, total, was lost. And she translated that into a beautiful mm -hmm. story. We called it Spilling, or the twins, because they were twins. And two beautiful sisters played the roles, mm -hmm. Bunny, Nickerman oh. and Margot Cohn, who were both the Wolf Sisters, mm -hmm. who had danced with their father, mm -hmm. danced and sang in USO mm -hmm. with their father, Sammy Wolf. And they did the twins. And that, it was a, just a very moving piece, how she was able to translate this idea of a village life, these two sisters growing up together, and then one going away, and then, uh, she, uh, just the way she was able to portray the Holocaust, it, it was a marvelous experience to work with her. And she had a wonderful piece of music. And we toured with that for a long time. It was a very popular piece. So Festival Dancers was like a continuum being able to uh, be in New York with people who knew about dance, who loved dance, and are willing to sacrifice because that's what it is. I, don't know, I said, festival dancers are just more organized than everybody else. Mm -hmm. They all have families. They all have to shop. They all have husbands they have to please, but they somehow manage mm -hmm. to find sure. time for rehearsal. And we used to meet twice a week. We used to meet, have technique class, then our rehearsals, then our composition classes. Nowadays, young women just don't have the time for it. And uh, I'm going to keep festival dancers going. I'm not ready to give up quite yet, <laughs> but I think I'm going to have to eliminate technique, mm -hmm. and then we would just we'll just meet for a rehearsal so that people can just rehearse the dances for programs. I'm always getting invitations uh, to put on a program. We've been invited. Our latest invitation is the uh, the League of Jewish uh, Women of uh, what is it? The, the organization. Help me. A uh, conservative yeah. Jewish, a uh, conservative, the Jewish Women's Conservative League, League yeah. for Conservative Jews. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. And uh, they're going to have a conference here in Detroit oh, that's right. at the Marriott, yeah. I believe, at the uh, Hyatt a national Airport. National conference. They're having a national conference, and they asked us mm -hmm. to do our, uh, our a very popular program, Dances of Our Heritage, which is. Eastern European, Yemenite, and Israeli dance. I mean, people don't, I think, have forgotten what a rich heritage we have that represents many aspects of Jewish life. And uh, we probably will do it in conjunction with the Israeli dance that meets on Wednesday night and include them, too. So, uh, because uh, this summer I had a very exciting experience of bringing one of Israel's leading choreographers, Shmulet Golavi, and Gov Ari, Gov Ari, excuse me. And uh, I, we had met him in Israel. Irv and I had gone on an Israeli 
tour that was all dance and he was one of the leaders and so he brought him to Detroit and he choreographed a dance for 40 people young and old I told him I don't care what you do but it has to have all ages in it and uh, he did and we presented it at the fair you know, at the 60th anniversary fair so that was uh, it was like I saw the plans excuse me Federation but you cannot do a 60th anniversary without Israeli dance I said there's no dance here and I felt it was my personal responsibility to make sure that Israeli dance was a part of it and it was it was a wonderful experience working with Shmuley and uh, the tradition of Israeli dance goes on in Israel and we have to help keep it alive here uh, we've had uh, Fred Burke came for one of our family dance weekends he's the grandfather I guess of modern dance and Judith Bryn Ingbar and I just found out that she wrote a book on Jewish dance which covers all these things that I've been lecturing about it's going to be published by the Wayne University Press H next have you year. ever written a book Judith um, Bryn no, no I haven't I'd like Judith to do it uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, then we had Hadassah Badok, who is the second lead uh, dancer in Imbal, which is a Yemenite company in Israel. Now, Hadassah it was a very interesting, very dear friend of mine. Her husband was a doctor from England, and he had been in the British Army when the Yemenite Jews were coming from Yemen. They walked literally from Yemen to Israel. And he was at the border checking. Uh, they had set up a, a station to check people for diseases, you know, and, and to spray them down when they came in because they were in a horrible condition. And Hadassah, who was a Yemenite who came to Israel that way, she and her family walked. She was uh, just a young girl of maybe 10 or 11. And she said that they probably were in this hospital way mm -hmm. station at the same time. Mm -hmm. This Aidan Coburn, whose children were in my Young Dancers Guild, who was a doctor in the British Army, and looking after immigrants mm -hmm. who were walking from Yemen, and they met at, uh, at Camp Tamarack at a oh, family uh -huh. dance weekend. Nice. <laughs> it was just amazing. <laughs> And so then we had Marguerite, who was the lead dancer, and she set a number of pieces for festival dancers. Uh, absolutely incredible performer from Yemen who sang, who danced, who told stories, who played the drum. And when we had her up at camp uh, for a family dance weekend, so I said, well, the children are going to be at this time. And then we're having a class for boys and fathers at this time. And then the dancers uh, who are experienced at this time. And she says, what are you doing? She says, put them all together. I said, you're going to teach boys of 12 and 13 and their fathers and put them all together, Harriet. That's the way we want them all together. That's the way it has to be for Yemenite dance. And by golly, I think we had 125 people. And she taught them all at the same time and got yeah, every single <laughs> woman involved and got them singing and interested in the Yemenite drum. And uh, she was an amazing teacher but she had this concept of dance being for everyone and everybody just do it together and if you don't know it you'll pick it up you know uh, and uh, it's in you we just need to release it <laughs> you were talking about the center I know Irving uh, Shaw was such an important man Irving and, Trump, yes Ir Irving. Uh, well I think why was I why am I still at the Jewish Community Center for 50 years? You know, I've had other opportunities. I've done other things. Uh, I have another company that does historical dance. I've lectured. Uh, now that I've become historical and antique, <laughs> I've become very interested in dances of 16th, 17th, 18th century. And uh, actually, we can do those dances because people wrote them down. That goes along with the music the directions but why have I been there and it's because uh, first of all of the wonderful executive directors who were so supportive who cared uh, although they were all 
yeah, they were all social workers. Mm -hmm. They all knew how the importance of the arts. And they wanted the arts at the Jewish Center. And then they had the membership that was totally supportive of it. And you know, people who founded JPI, a lot of them were physical education teachers, dance teachers uh, from the public school system. Mm -hmm. And they included dance in JPI curriculum. They have an Israeli dance teacher to this day. And Erwin Shaw was, he'd come down and watch the classes, you know, and he would be thrilled. He'd let us know if anybody needed dancers. Oh, well, I want you to do this, you know, you have to do this. And he knew Ur from Fresh Air Camp. That was another connection that gave me an in with <laughs> Erwin Shaw because uh, Irv had been on the, fac uh, on the staff there at Fresh Air, lo, these many years ago. So, uh, and then after, then my supervisors, Frank Lowenberg and Chuck Wolf, Kitty Rudner, Adele Silver, and now this new wonderful young woman, I don't know where she came from, I think Texas, is Heidi? it possible? Heidi yeah. Buda, yeah. who uh, loves dance, mm -hmm. and she has been anything that she could do to help us, she has done. You know, I don't have to go to meetings. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> supportive environment. <laughs> very supportive environment. I appreciated, needed, and wanted the arts to be a part of it. And we have to keep that going. That we have to pass it on to the next generation to make sure that the arts are part of the Jewish Community Center experience. It's not just sports, not that they're not important, it's not just the health club. We have to make sure that there is, uh, that the arts are being taught and encouraged and, and shown. Uh, at the center, I'm hoping there is rumors abroad that there's going to be a theater built. And I, I want to make sure that dance is, uh, that it is built for dance as well as theater. It's, it's time, we need to have that. We did bring the Bakshaba Company and other dance companies at the Curtis and Myers Building. We had that beautiful Weiner Theater. Oh, that was a fabulous old theater. 450 seats, that's all we really need. <laughs> but I understand it's going to be larger. Uh, so that's fine, but we need a theater. I think it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen too. I mean, Evelyn and I have been with each other for many, many years. We used to do television shows together when she worked for Federation and put on their holiday shows and I did a lot of dance for her. And she, it's remarkable what she has done with a very small space, but it's just not adequate for dance. She has found people who are willing to work with her and create a, a setting that she could use. She's chosen her plays very well. And she's done a remarkable job with Jet, but we need a real theater. And I wish it were being built at 10 Mile because the yeah, people there. It's a gem of a building. Really, yes, a the small gem theater <laughs> in the, right, the 10 gem. Mile building. Because they appreciate and want and need the arts too. All the Russian immigrants are very, very uh, into the arts. So it's wonderful being a part of this community, and I think this is just what has seduced me to stay here Good. and stay in Detroit. And Detroit has always had an underground art movement. I mean, it may look like the sports capital of the world, and now it is, I guess, if we could only get a winning team, <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> but uh, the arts have always been important here. Look, they built Orchestra Hall for Asip Gavrilovich, right? He said, I'm not going to stay here unless you have a decent hall for me to play in. And they built Orchestra Hall, one of the finest acoustical auditoriums in the country. And, uh, and the galleries, what's going on? We live in midtown Detroit. There are a dozen galleries within a mile of where we live. And uh, competing and showing and expanding. So, uh, you know, Detroit has that underground that, well, I mean, to me, it just, that goes on in spite of everything else, you know? And the automobile manufacturers have been extremely supportive, certainly, of uh, Detroit Opera House, that we have our own opera house. This was very important to Daimler Chrysler. Uh, and Michigan Opera, David D. Kara has done an amazing job, and his wife, Karen. 
what they have done to create an opera in Detroit. And there are, and then the music hall, and its series. And there is an audience, and there is, sometimes you feel you have to wake up every day and start all over again, but there is an audience for it out there. And that's what keeps us in Detroit, yeah. And I know that you made uh, your own um, uh, uh, commitment to the uh, Renaissance dancers. Yes. And, and Madame Cadillac. Yes. Right. And that were, that when I was at the American Dance Festival, I had a chance to uh, meet and study with some very interesting women who were musicologists. But this was like 40 years ago that they would say, well, how can we play this music if we don't know what the dances are? And they were the ones who started this, uh, reconstructing the dances and finding these old documents. Mm -hmm. And I got hooked on Renaissance dance. And Edith Freeman, I told her about this, that I had been studying Renaissance dance. She said, well, why don't you present them? I need a program. And I'll get Renaissance, the Renaissance Hall for you. And so I used festival dancers, dressed half of them as men, half as women, and we presented these dances that I had learned just by coincidence, there was a woman by the name of Mary Johnson who had a recorders group who was looking for places to perform, and a student at Wayne who had a project making historical costumes. Somebody gave me some drapes, <laughs> and we made these wonderful <laughs> Renaissance costumes. And Audley Grossman, who was head of theater, saw this. He was looking through the window down into the Renaissance court. I said, uh, well, what do you think? He said, if you get rid of those men, I mean, those women dressed in <laughs> men's costume. I said, but Shakespeare did it. He says, it was a different period. Uh, he says, I think we've got something. And in 1972, he started the Wassail Feast. But on for 27 years, it was, you know, like what launched the holiday season in Detroit. I'll never forget, uh, we have a receiving line at the end of the feast and the banquet and the entertainment. And I had got to play the role of uh, Good Queen Bess with a red wig. And this woman came up and she whispered in my ear, what's a nice Jewish girl like you doing here? <laughs> uh, it wasn't a religious feast. Yeah. It oddly kept that very low key. We did sing some carols. But it was uh, a pagan wassail yeah. bringing in the Yule log and chasing out the winter and bringing in, uh, you know, celebrating. Uh, the winter solstice. So I always felt very comfortable with it. And we did start it with our Renaissance dance company. And God, there used to be a dozen wassail feasts. We used to perform a half a dozen times. And we did that till uh, they started the renovations mm -hmm. at the museum. And then the Madame Cadillac Dance Theater, I thought, well, if I can do 16th century dance, it'll be a cinch to find out about 17th century. It's a whole hundred years of but that wasn't that easy. Uh, because I went to the Burton Historical Collection, and I said, I'd like a book on dancing and recreation at Fort Pontchartrain. Because I knew the French, like, he says, nothing. <laughs> he says, uh, first place, there's no women here. <laughs> well, that really got my goat. I was a feminist. <laughs> Esther Broder made me into a feminist. I said, no women here? Up on the third floor, there's a big mural by Gary Melkers. The landing of Madame Cadillac, 1701. She came about three months after her husband with another woman and their children. And uh, then I had to go and find out about her. And I got a creative artist grant, and uh, I won a couple of grants that year. And that enabled me to research her life, and I was hooked. This was a woman that nobody knew about, and she was just as important as her husband in the founding of Detroit. So that was the beginning of the Madame Cadillac Dance Theater. We celebrated our uh, 27th anniversary. Did you ever travel with that group? Did you ever go yeah, to France? Yeah, right. We went to France four times. Mm -hmm. I went there to do research, and when they found out I had a dance company, they invited us back, and we went every other year mm -hmm. uh, until 2000. They, they were the most wonderful people. They knew nothing of the history of their own ancestor who founded Detroit, but they were so excited about it. I mean, Cadillac car, 
they had a rally of Cadillac cars. These cars, where these people in Europe find the parts to restore <laughs> these cars, I mean, find out they're dukes and duchesses and very wealthy uh, people of Europe love to restore old cars and they would have a rally of all these old cars and then we would entertain them. <clears throat> it was a great experience and we stayed in people's houses and uh, they were so gracious and the first time I saw the stage and these lights and I thought, oh my goodness, is there going to be a rock band performing here at the same time we are? No, that's for your yeah. company. <laughs> Okay, kids, dance big. <laughs> and we had live music. We always brought live music. We have a wonderful violinist, uh, a young man by the name of Leslie Gregory, whose father is Oz. Was his father's name was Oz. I think his father and mother are Jewish, but uh, he knows very little about his Jewish background. So I've gotten him into that. Klezmer music also. He then he belonged to a Klezmer band, but he was a brilliant violinist. He's an engineer at General Motors. And the young woman who plays Madame Cadillac is an engineer at Chrysler mm -hmm. in Warren. Just a coincidence, but it helped. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the um, dance archives at the Luther. At Wayne, yeah. Uh, when we moved from our house in northwest Detroit, uh, to the Park Shelton that was just supposed to be for a year until we could find a smaller house in Huntington Woods. Okay, I gave all of my dance collection, which was books and papers, pictures, tapes, records, to Wayne. And they put it away in the safe. I, I didn't know what happened to it. And then one day I get a note from a young woman by the name of Julia Long and she says, there's now, you might like to see the Harriet Berg Dance Archives in the Wayne Library. And she organized all this stuff and made an archive out of it. And at that time, um, who was the man who was the head of the department? Was it the Bill library? Mason? Bill Mason? Uh, no, no, it was before, oh. uh, he was Wayne Library. Oh, oh library, yeah. Wayne Library, <clears throat> and he said he was going to build a room for archives, mm -hmm. and he built a room for the dance archives. It was about 35 feet, and she, after she came to this meeting with me, she says, Harriet, give it to the Walter Ruther. Mm -hmm. I said, Walter Ruther, but that's labor library. And she says, no, not anymore. And she arranged for me to meet the director at that time, who was very anxious to expand the Walter Ruther Library, which was just labor history, but now it's called the Walter Ruther Library of Urban Affairs. Mm -hmm. And they have the papers of the Detroit Symphony, the, the theater, oh, many different organizations and people yeah, in the Jewish community city. archives are And there. the Jewish yeah. community archives right. are there too. And of course, it's a state of the art. It is one of the finest archives. I was so happy to be introduced to it. And uh, you know, people said, what are you doing in the Walter Ruther Library? Well, it's not. And after all, there was that beautiful uh, bar relief of dancers that came from the, wall, uh, the Ruther's right. Garden. May yeah. Ruther uh, commissioned it. That's in front of that library, right. and that is our mm -hmm. symbol on our stationery. So, uh, so it was the Harriet Berg archives, and then there was the hundred-year exhibit, hundred years of the automobile at the Detroit Historical Museum. And I, as I went through it, I thought. Wouldn't it be fun to know about the dances of these people of the past hundred years? And that's how the Michigan Dance Archives came into being. And I found three wonderful uh, supporters, Maggie Allisey, uh, and then Margot Cohen, and Ellen Kahn, whose son danced with Paul Taylor Company, oh. and who was married to Carolyn Brown, who was the, the lead dancer at that time. And they helped me raise the funds to put on something that had never been done before, a hundred years of Detroit dance. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was just a phenomenal exhibit and in every area, social dance, ethnic dancing, modern dance, dance at the universities. And we had a very rich history. And this was an opportunity to 
presented in a beautiful display a woman by the name of Marge Long, who I found out later was a dancer before she became a curator. And she loved this exhibit, mm -hmm. and it was her last exhibit. Yeah. She died, I think, of, of cancer, and she hadn't told people. She worked on this exhibit, you know. Well, we still have it, and it tours, you know. It tours throughout the state, colleges. We'll borrow it for exhibit. And uh, right now, the director is um, the Ruther? No, at the Ruther is Smith. Mike, Mike, Smith. Mike, Smith. Mike Smith, and he has been very supportive. Yes. He's great, and we're ready to do another exhibit. Oh, good! <laughs> yeah, on the stars of Detroit. <laughs> what, yeah. What's on the horizon call, for you? <laughs> uh, that uh, the stars of Detroit and uh, people who have achieved international prominence who got their start here in Detroit. So that's going to be our next exhibit, and then Carol Halstead who is the head of dance at uh, the, the Opera House, a former festival dancer, so she'll take that exhibit, and then Wayne will take it. So it's just a matter of finding a date. That is a very, very popular exhibit hall, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's almost impossible. Yeah. We may have to go into the smaller hall, uh, the, you know, um, at the side, the yeah, side yeah. exhibit area, which would be fine. So that uh, future for the Michigan Dance Archives we have accumulated some amazing people's papers. I got part of Olga Fricker's. Many of her papers, of course, went to the Toronto Dance Library because she was a Canadian. I didn't realize that. When I went out after her papers, they said, no, 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 it's <laughs> Canada. And uh, uh, Garth Fagan, uh, who is the choreographer of um, Lion King and was a a dancer in the Wayne University Dance Workshop, one of my students. I gave him his first leading role. Wonderful guy, he was an English major who liked to dance, came from Jamaica. And uh, the, um, um, the tap dancer was one of the, the sultans who, uh, who was in this black and blue touring company that was touring Europe with an incredible review of t the history of tap dancing, and he was one of them. Uh, it's from Detroit. I'm sorry, I'm just, his name will come to me tonight. Um, come on. <laughs> uh, we have his papers, and uh, a lot of people have given some of the, one of Fanny Aronson's dancers. So when people found out there was a place where their papers could go and we could preserve them, uh, they have given their papers to the Michigan Dance Archives at the Walter Ruther Library of Living at Urban Affairs. It's a lasting legacy. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And yeah. your legacy is yeah. just, There's, it's remarkable. <laughs> it, and your energy and vitality just continues on. And what's your message? How do, how do you keep going? <laughs> <laughs> what is the message? <laughs> just keep dancing. Mm -hmm. Keep the energy going. <laughs> Dancing doesn't take energy, it gives Good energy, thing. yeah. And it unites people, it brings joy to people. And I think that's it, stay in touch with young people. They are full, I mean, dancing is so different now. It is so different. And uh, I, as I say, I'm an antique, and I realize historical dance to them is Jose Limon. <laughs> <laughs> That's historical. When I talk about 16th century, what? what? <laughs> What's that? Uh, but uh, it links us to so many wonderful experiences of, of, the, of the human, of humankind, and that our rich heritage of modern, of, uh, of dance that we have. The Jews are dancing people was one of the early books I read, and I love that. It's true from biblical times till now. And I hope there's going to be a tour, I understand, by the Jewish uh, Foundation for Culture, Ju National Jewish Foundation for Culture. They are touring nine new companies from Israel. Oh, how Can wonderful. you believe this? In all of their chaos, you think, in their, all of their trauma, Nine young modern dance companies are going to be toured next year, and I hope we get them here in here. Detroit. I hope so. Yeah, Bacheva's going to be in Ann Arbor. I hope we can get them in Detroit. 
Ohad Naharim's mother was taking her master's in dance education when I was at Wayne. And Ohad used to come with her to class. And he'd be crawling all over the walls and, and uh, <laughs> choreographing, I'm sure. And the walls and running all over and leaping with us across the floor. He was a great energetic kid. And he sucked it all up and now he's, mm -hmm. he's a brilliant director and choreographer. You knew him so, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so dance is a connection to life, to people. I say just keep dancing. <laughs> This has been a delightful interview for me. Thank you. And you it, too. Uh, is there anything I failed to ask you? Anything I, else you like to say? I think we really covered it all. Oh, good. I did say that my husband has been the key also. Get a good husband, like Urban Burton. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Harriet. <laughs>